Hey, New Trust Economy, this is Tracy Hazard here, and I am excited to bring you an interesting guest I met at a meetup. Guess what? <laughs> a meetup on cryptocurrency. So I have Alon Gorin, and he is of CIS and the Security Token Summit. And we're going to talk a lot about some things that are going on. And he gave a really interesting presentation and caught my eye because it was really pointing out some of the missing pieces to what's going on in the whole community. So in order for us to really tokenize our businesses, there are bits and pieces still not quite ready for prime time. And this reminds me of my, my earlier days, five years ago plus, in uh, 3D printing, when I was covering 3D printing for WTFFF. And we had the same thing. We were always talking about the missing pieces. So I know this is going to be really interesting for you. And he has tremendous experience. And I'm going to kind of cover that in his bio as we go through this, because he's also the host of Southern California's largest group of investors and entrepreneurs. It's called 805 Startups. And I just found out that 805 is the area code because I don't <laughs> happen to live in that area code, even though it's huge. And so he's got a lot of exposure and view of what's going on in building and supporting startups and entrepreneurs in this space, in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. So Alan, welcome. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. So, you know, you're not just in the blockchain cryptocurrency, you're kind of overall in looking at it from the crowdfunding view. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was my, uh, that was my first sort of, you know, um, dive into, I guess, financial technology. Technically, I had a very short period of time where I worked uh, in the systems architecture group at Countrywide, fresh out of school. Um, but, uh, but I really didn't do anything important there. Um, uh, at, I was working at MySpace and then at Amazon back in the day, and I thought, how cool would it be to use these social networking tools that we had built to help people raise money online? And that was the, we, we launched a social fundraising platform called Invested In before the word crowdfunding existed. And, before uh, it was kind of in the new rules. <laughs> exactly. And it was before it was legal, really, and we quickly realized that we couldn't do what we exactly wanted to do, so we went sort of the the nonprofit model and the Kickstarter Indiegogo model until it was legal. Um, and then we had clients who raised money privately, but used the same technology to amplify it and, and all sorts of things like that. So, uh, but yeah, that's, that's why I originally came into it. And a couple of years ago, I got, I, you know, sort of dove into crypto full time. So our conference crowd invest summit became crypto invest summit. And now know, it's just CIS. Cause now it's just CIS because we've got enterprise <laughs> blockchain, we've got security tokens, we've got builders tracks where thousands of engineers come to, to learn about building in the space. So it's, it's a really, really cool, um, you know, uh, evolution for, for me, but it's kind of the evolution of the industry. So, so yeah. you've been in support of the Jobs Act as it shifted because that made crowdfunding more possible. So I got a decent following uh, at the early days of crowdfunding by kind of talking trash and saying there's no chance and <laughs> I don't know what I can say. Uh, there, there's no chance the government is going to do anything to make it easier for anyone to do anything, you know, and I'm this punk rocker. I grew up, uh, <laughs> you know, a very, very sort of anti-establishment. And, and so I didn't believe the government would create rules that would make it better. Um, so when all of my friends in the space were telling me this thing called the Jobs Act is coming, I, I thought it was BS. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then it happened. And, uh, you know, uh, one part of me was really excited because it did make certain things better. But the other part of me was still offended because I thought it was still not really American and not really fair and not really what it could be and should be. Um, uh, I'm not like a full hardcore libertarian uh, you know, um, to, to that end, but I am, you know, I do believe that um, people are inherently good and are going to do the right thing. And so if, and if people are doing bad things, they should still go to jail and they should, you know, the, the crowd will find them. So I thought it was kind of offensive, you know, to have the accredited investor rules still. So telling that we could or couldn't invest in something, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the rules basically say um, with certain types of deals now, we are allowed to participate if we're not millionaires. And with other types of deals, you can only participate if you're a millionaire. So it's um, kind of blocking and, you. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's insane because we were hoping sort of the dream of crowdfunding and the dream of the democratization of capital is to level the playing field so that whether you're a, you know, startup in Utah or a 
uh, investor in Atlanta or you're in uh, Nairobi, you could participate in the same deals, right? Right. Um, or, or you can do, you know, raise money on the internet because you have a good idea and not just because you have access to people who are millionaires. Um, yeah. so, so that was the whole idea. And so, so, you know, crypto was exciting, especially 2017, 2018 was sort of the wild west of ICOs, but um, obviously going unchecked, there was a lot of craziness and a lot of fraud. Um, yes. And, and, and so, so that that's kind of another reason why we probably don't want to call it the you know <laughs> the crypto summit and stuff well, like that. Well, that is one one reason why we don't want to call it crypto invest summit anymore. But the the main reason is that you know I I am actually still a huge fan of cryptocurrencies. I think that the people who did wrong should go to jail and should get punished, and that will keep people from doing wrong later uh, more than than rules and laws because criminals don't give a crap whether there's rules and laws they're still going to be criminals so the fact that you know it's regulated doesn't mean that bad people are going to stop uh terrorizing people it means that good people are now just going to have more expense and more hoops to jump through and less ability to actually do good so so that that is the frustrating part of the the conundrum of the whole thing right. but it also drops us into security tokens, which can take hopefully these, these old rules and um, with, tech, with the aid of technology, with the aid of automation, with the aid of smart contracts and, and things like that, um, hopefully make the rules usable for everyone. Um, yeah, so, yeah. you know, this is one of the things that I like to ask everyone who comes on the show is like, you know, so at, you're, you're having such experience in, in fintech in general and, and going through the crowdfunding model, but what part of it, where did sort of blockchain cryptocurrency come in for you and you go, this is really what I've been looking for. This fills a need. So I, I love, um, uh, you know, there, there's so many things for me. For me, it, it really is like that crowdfunding thing. It finally clicked, right? So there's a few things. I had this dream, and this is actually a, a vision for a product that I've well documented. I, I you know, started to raise money for back in the day with my old company, and I really, really believe in it. And somebody should steal it from me, and it's being built really in the, in the blockchain space in general. But um, when you take it a step uh, outside of the, the crowdfunding that we're talking about with everybody being able to do everything. Um, one of the biggest, you know, there are, there's a, in the United States alone, and the, the numbers probably changed since the last few years when I've, when I've looked it up, but the alternative investment space just in the United States alone is somewhere around $7 trillion a year. So that $7 trillion, a majority, not, not more than, much more than 50%, but let's say 51% or more, is raised by third party marketers. That basically just means licensed investment bankers. So right. if it's a real estate deal, they pay between three and 10% to help raise the money. Um, some types of venture funds, all these different funds raise money using third parties. Um, and those third parties all sort of have their own lane. They all do their own thing. And if you're a, family office or a wealthy person, you go to maybe that group to do your real estate deals, that group to do startup deals, and you're constantly getting phone calls from other you know, um, broker dealers and things trying to get you in on different deals. Um, there's no real way for them to trust using technology to help them in their process when they could. If they do use any kind of technology, it's proprietary, it's their own thing, they're living in Salesforce, they're picking up the phone, they're making phone calls, but what, what I would really, really love is if there was one single platform and we actually built a model where if you have a broker dealer, you could do co-marketing agreements with other broker dealers. And if Tracy introduces me to an investor for a real estate deal and they don't invest, but three years from now they invest in my company, I could still pay Tracy legally through um, a co-marketing agreement between our broker dealers for that introduction. And so imagine if there was one single platform for raising money on the internet where non-accredited investors could go to, accredited investors could go to, everybody could be whitelisted, um, for example, and uh, the regulation for where they're located could be tracked and traced and constantly changed, right, in an underlying layer. And then 
every single time somebody invests in something or a particular deal is invested in, whoever brought that deal to the table, whoever's still in charge of that deal of verifying the information and, and doing the, the paperwork that, that takes place, hopefully it's very minimal because it's all online, can actually continue to be paid on that deal. Right now, a, you know that that yeah. is almost exactly the same reason that it excited me, but slightly different because I'm a product girl. So I'm I'm a hard goods product girl. I design products for mass market retail that you bought at Costco and Walmart and Target. And the problem that I saw is that there's so many great products and great ideas out there that don't get invested in, that don't get brought to market. Mm -hmm. But then eventually they come through the, through the channels, and the original creator didn't get credit for it. Yeah. And so when I heard Steve Wozniak talking about that and so passionate about blockchain as a solution for that, I thought, hmm, maybe it is finally time where your creative value is rewarded. And what it really does, and that's what you're sort of saying here, is it, it brings more deals to the table. It brings more products and ideas into the world because we're not afraid of us having to keep it secret and having to keep yeah. that, that hidden because we're afraid, oh, we'll lose our part of the deal. Exactly. And it's very simple, traceable, verifiable, and written into an immutable uh, blockchain, right? Into an immutable ledger. So imagine if Tracy sends me a deal and, you know, six months goes by and then something happens and I make a lot of money on that deal. And technically, I'm, I, I have a piece of paper saying I need to pay Tracy for it. Um, if, uh, if I forget to mention it to Tracy and she doesn't know that it happens anymore because she's moved on to the next thing, is Tracy going to get paid, right? Um, but shouldn't a creator of something, right? Um, that, that, that's an even better uh, analogy, right? Shouldn't a creator of something, some piece of content, imagine this podcast 30 years from now, somebody pays for it somewhere um, because it's been taken from somewhere and reposted somewhere or reposted on a website that serves advertisements or something. Shouldn't Tracy get, get her her piece of that, like as, as the owner, as a, that, that piece of art behind you, wouldn't it be nice if you sold it on eBay five years from now, if the original artist got some piece of that? Um, that's he might be dead. That's Joseph Albers, but <laughs> he's pretty dead, but his, his estate should get it. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and this is the thing that goes through my mind a lot in, in what's going on in, in the community, because look, I, I talk to thousands of inventors every year like thousands of them between trade shows and events that I speak at and just taking phone calls. And what I do is I just make straight referrals. And I finally had to create a platform to self, to let people self refer, which they don't do at the pace as if they talk to me. Yeah. And, but the problem is, is I can't make a living making referrals. Like I, cause yeah. I don't char I don't believe in affiliate fees. Yeah. Because I can't, I don't want people to be paying more for the people I'm referring. Yes. I would refer them anyway, but you just don't, I, you just don't know until you meet me and I don't know which one, which person to refer you to until I meet you and know your project, right? So it's become a problem because I can't be, get paid for my time there. So I was like, what am I going to do? Created another podcast, created a platform for it, but at the same time, it's not quite as effective. So wouldn't it be great if it was just like my, my product royalty is it paid my bills? And so that really helps that free flow of really moving people forward, really moving them through deals, really moving the brokers in to bringing more ideas forward. And really it starts yeah, it, to filter it, up it the really, great ideas really at the end oh, of the absolutely. day. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it really works in these, in these certain verticals and certain things like in the investment world where people are constantly, you know, like I said, majority of that $7 trillion is raised by third party brokers. They're, they're always so afraid they're going to be circumvented. Here's a way to track it, trace it, and, and it'd be impossible to be circumvented. Uh, well, next to impossible if, if you do it right. So in, in our world and these referrals, I'm a huge fan of doing exactly what you're saying. I, if somebody goes, hey, I'll pay you a commission if you help me find it, this, this, this. I say no almost every time across the board because I know that making those introductions and, and doing that will come back tenfold later in other opportunities. Right. And that's how I do it. It's just only, uh, there's only so much time in the day, right? Term, right. It's hard in the near term to pay your bills. Um, right. so, so you have to have a business. And so everyone, you know, as much as we all love what we do, we, we have to live and we have to have a business. And so this, there's different ways in which this can enable that for, for people, especially in this new world where the gig economy and, and the new trust economy, right? Right. Um, you, uh, you, everybody is sort of independent. 
and how do you track things? You're not getting a paycheck day to day to do this for a living. You are, this is you. I mean, your, your living is, is what you do every day. You know, you've done some work in the, in the, um, entertainment industry. So you know how it works there. And, you know, I think about that. They have a really, they have it, uh, you know, old school way, not in smart contracts yeah. and blockchain, but they actually have it better because they're very used to having royalty rights and smart contracts that have like how much participation, do, how much credit you get. And, but they have a bunch of lawyers managing all of that, they right? Also, lawyers and accountants, but, like it's huge. Yes, but they're also notoriously uh, uh, predatory with certain people who don't know what they're signing. So it's, uh -huh, you know, that's right. there's, there's a term in the entertainment industry. And I only learned this term from a, a book. There's a book uh, called The Soul of the Deal by Richard Wolpert. He is um, one of uh, my previous investors and one of my mentors. And, and I love this guy. And I sat down and I listened to a talk he gave and I read his book and I did, you know, a fireside chat with him at one point. And one of the terms that he talks about in the entertainment world is called monkey points. Because what they'll do is they'll create something where they'll say, you know, you're going to get four points on the profit of the this, of the this. And it's so convoluted that no matter what happens in the end, their accountants will show this movie did not make money. I forgot. There's some example. I, I don't remember the exact movie, but it was some, maybe it was Forrest Gump or something like that, where like one of the highest grossing movies of all time lost money. Because they just use creative accounting, they pay for all of the bills of all of the you know studio and advertising, whatever from this one movie's you know thing, and somehow you know uh, the the actors never get their uh, never get their points. It's so, so the same in product design. So like so, I can tell you how many times I've been screwed out of royalty along the way and didn't make my upside. And so people want to know why is it so expensive to work with you? Well, here's why. So well, if I'm not going to get it in upfront, and that's what I just read an article recently about the, the reason why it's so difficult to get attached good actors to the show is because to the movies are because they are putting all everything in their upfront because they're just not willing to be screwed again. Yeah. And so they're like, I'm done. I, and this is my fee or it's not worth my time. And so if that's really, yeah. So creativity could be really explored and exploded by this. Well, especially with now, now let's think of uh, how most things are distributed through Netflix and Amazon and digitally and, and all this stuff. You could technically, if you were a, um, if you were an actor, you were in that industry and you did it over the blockchain. This is something I talk about with a friend that's in LA in the tokenization space. Imagine a real time dashboard to see what the profits of a movie are um, and the actual uh, and your actual distribution. Uh, it, it wouldn't be that tough anymore to have it in almost real time. Um, right. I mean, you can even tie the advertising to it because most advertising is bought digitally as well now. Even if it's, you know, even if it is uh, uh, a billboard somewhere, it's still bought online and digitally through, through agencies. So right. everything could be shown to the actors and actresses and, and you know, crew, you know, a permissioned, uh, you know, ledger basically with the cap table of the movie showing you exactly what's happening in real time. And if this gets sold here, or if there's a contract here, if this, this is how much you're going to make. Um, right. It's totally possible now. Yeah. It, oh, it absolutely is. I just sat in at the digital entertainment world conference and sat in on a couple of um, blockchain and Hollywood kind of, yeah. um, kind of uh, panel discussions. And one of the things that they were talking about was a little bit more on the music industry side, but very similar problems. So if you're doing music videos on YouTube, you have to enroll your video in with one particular um, li licensed agent yeah. in order for it to not get shut down on YouTube because they'll yeah. shut it down because you're using some these music so like so uh, you have to yeah. go through that panel and so it's costing you points and money and percentages for something that isn't actually making you money that per se on YouTube for the most part you're just getting you know hopefully millions of listeners that's their idea so that they'll buy the album and so you know it's not you're you're paying out for something you're not yeah. actually making money back on yeah well the music industry is has all has in the recent last 20 years or whatever, uh, it, you know, it's the, the individual artists mostly make money off of touring and actually in-person stuff and not, not making money online. 
I, I don't know if that, that's good or bad. I, I tend to think it's better than it used to be, actually, because there used to be you know, a few certain rock stars that would have good contracts and actually make money off of their contracts. Um, but so many more people have access to actually having a following now. If, if you go into it thinking, I'm not going to make money off of producing the music, I'm going to make money off of the appearances, or you go into it with the thought, this might be my punk rocker self also <laughs> kind of going like, if one person listens to it, it's better than if I, uh, than if I had a contract and nobody listened to it. Um, there you go. <laughs> so, um, but but I, I do believe you. There, if you use it right in this new world, you could get listeners around the world that you wouldn't have had before. And, you know, I don't know. I, maybe if I was a full-time musician, I'd think differently. But uh, <laughs> well, we actually have a few exploring the use of podcasting as an inroad because um, Spotify bought bought a uh, podcast hosting company recently, yeah. and so there's a lot of that going on. And so Spotify, iHeart, all of them play it. But if you if you don't want to go through that sort of normal distribution to put it out as a limited edition podcast, so there's there's a lot of exploration going on in that way, which is in a way still like doing indie movies, right? They're independent, and so they can produce everything themselves and hopefully recapture all of that. So, well, yeah. It's yeah, the world of stealing music, too, gave way to iTunes and gave way to this new method where people are paying for music again, where they weren't before. And, and you know, um, if, if you were a musician 10 years ago, you probably had less chance of making money than you do today with, with iTunes and stuff because somehow – people got super lazy, decided that stealing music was much harder than just paying 99 cents. <laughs> now all of a sudden, um, you know, 99 cents, no big deal. I mean, we, we both paid, uh, you know, like four bucks for yeah, coffee. For coffee. <laughs> yeah. um, so yeah. there's, there's something, there is something to it. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about what, what I heard at your meetup. So, you know, what, one of the interesting things that caught my ear was you talking about the, the sort of whole of, so let's say you tokenize your business and it's great. And so, so I've got my business, I've tokenized it, I found investors and I'm super excited about it. But now we have an exchange problem. So now they can't really easily exchange the tokens for other things they're interested in or even exchange between themselves, that there's a little bit of that exchange model that is, sure. is in, in the works still. Yeah, so with security tokens, you're essentially taking a startup. I mean, people are doing it with real estate. People will be doing it with more mature companies and stuff. But at the moment, it's mostly startups and, and real estate deals. So let's say you're taking your startup and you're tokenizing it. And you do have something that's liquid, quote unquote, right? You have a token that one token might be worth $20 in the company or something, whatever it is. And it's, it's tied to equity or a revenue share or something like that. And just because you have it doesn't mean that there's another person that wants to buy it from you. And um, it's a very, very common problem in the micro cap and small cap investment world. So there are companies worth tens of millions of dollars or even less that trade on uh, OTC markets and places like that. And they have these small conferences around the world for them to promote their companies to investor relations people and things like that. But just because something is liquid doesn't mean that there's somebody there to buy it. So there's this promise of liquidity. Mark, uh, Mark Boyron, who was on the panel, or no, he, he, was, he was in the audience, but I've done panels with him since. Um, he likes to tell people the fundraising part is really the hardest part in terms of getting it done because it's dependent on other people. It's also technically one of the less costly parts because tokenizing kind of costs a lot of money. There's legal aspects to deal with. There's third party vendors and things you've got to deal with and you don't need the token. And there's marketing and getting the information out and the amount of, of time it takes you to get them funding. So. <laughs> and, and, um, excuse me. Um, and there's, uh, there is, uh, there's just a big long process of tokenization that's unnecessary at the beginning. And the cost is gonna go down a lot. It's gonna get, you know, it's gonna be one of those race sounds to the bottom for all the service providers that are doing the tokenization part. The, the technology of tokenization will be the easy part very soon, um, the easiest part. So, but the fundraise is the hardest part. And there's no reason why you have to tokenize today to raise money for your company today. You could do a normal convertible note um, do a normal, easy fundraising process, just like every startup, 
fundraises that's not on the blockchain, but there'll be one block of text that says, you know, we, uh, you know, reserve the option to, or we plan on, um, you know, tokenizing our assets at a certain point. Um, and you do that because once you raise money, once you have the budget for it, once it makes sense to, you can tokenize. Because when we're talking about early stage startups, the average exit for an early stage startup is like eight to 10 years. So an early stage investor that's a professional investor doesn't expect to get their money back if they get their money back for eight to 10 years. So to assume that just because it's legally transferable um, doesn't mean there's going to be a bunch of people who want to buy it. And in the process, startups go like this, right? Like startups up and down, go up and down. Up and down. <laughs> I forgot we're, we're audio too. Um, so start, startups are going up and down. It's a roller coaster ride. And one day somebody could think their startup is dead and the next day it could become Airbnb. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's why uh, tokenization creates this opportunity that's a potential great opportunity, but it doesn't mean for sure there's going to be somebody there. You would be, you would be, um, I know a lot of companies are selling it like we're going to have this liquid asset and it's going to be awesome. And maybe it will be, but there isn't a community there yet. And there may be, and there probably will be, but at the end of the day, just because something is possible doesn't mean it's for sure happening. So it's, in my opinion, you should sell the investment opportunity and you should talk about how you're creating a way to where there may be liquidity or this option or there's this piece of technology that hopefully will make it be a little better. So I think I mentioned it at the meetup, um, the former vice chairman of NASDAQ, um, when I talked to him about um, all of these tokenizations and all these things, he, he sort of made this observation that um, bond funds and these bond products that exist trade at a, I think he said a three to 5% premium when they calculate their interest, um, I think he said uh, quarterly or, or monthly over quarterly. So if you normally calculate your interest quarterly, if you just calculate your interest monthly, you all of a sudden uh, trade at a three to 5% premium. Wow. That, that's significant in an investment world. It's, you make 3% more money. Um, so, uh, so imagine in this new world where things are automated, where things are online, imagine if you could calculate interest daily, calculate interest by the second. I mean, uh, it probably wouldn't be efficient, but, but if you imagine if every single day, if you had a product that yielded interest, if every single day you literally got that money into your account and you got an extra buck 25 in your, in your bank account daily versus getting it every quarter or every month and you could trade it back and forth. Um, that, that will make things more valuable. It will make things more interesting. And it'll, it'll make business yeah. more stable too. It'll make business more stable. And at the end of the day, you know, I don't know from a startup perspective, if having so, like a public stock or a public token um, is actually good for business. It could be good for marketing if done right. Like you have this army of people who own your tokens and now you're launching products and doing things. That's great. But think about how hard, it's really freaking hard to launch a startup. And imagine if you had something that even if you didn't consider the fact that there's probably going to be five to $10,000 a month in expenses that are tied to this, which is the number one reason startups fail is running out of money. So let's pretend, let's throw that out the window and pretend that doesn't exist. Just the mind share of the having to deal with public shareholders and answer their questions and market it and deal with it versus running the actual company. It's not necessarily a good thing. No, uh, I, had, I had 13 angel investors in my very first business in 1998. And, um, and I've never taken investors since then because it, they were, it was like members of an LLC so, and they were people I knew. So it was like, there was always a phone call. There was always like this. There was always like, I'd issue out a report and they'd go like, they'd question everything. Yeah. And so I was like, I was like, I don't ever want to do this again. <laughs> so I, I had a lot of investors in my last company and I actually, for the most part, had a really good experience with them that they were mostly professional, great people. We did have one and a half not so friendly investors, even when things were going well. 
to the point where the good investors start to get mad at me sometimes because they say, how come you haven't done a quarterly report in, in way too long or send us, you used to send monthly reports and now you don't send very much. And I realized I was not being very good to the good investors because there was a couple of bad seeds. Because every time you issued it, you'd get all these calls. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. what you mean. <laughs> and, you know, you'd get called on these things. What do you mean exactly by this? You know, why did that customer, you know, uh, yeah. um, go away? <laughs> why did this thing happen? And you're, you're dealing with that versus running the company. And so yeah. it's, it, yeah. So imagine now time. It's a full time oh. job. That's right. And oh. I think that's what you're pointing is that, yeah. you know, that this is not just a full time job of, of raising investment and tokenizing and doing all those things, but it also adds a lot of costs and, and, and distractions yes. to the business on a daily basis. And with so many things in flux and many unknowns, that's that you're just adding more risk variables into yep. your startup. So it may not be the right thing. Now, there are, I think, a few exceptions where only blockchain or, you know, could solve the could well, solve what they you could need. solve the instant reporting and things like that but you know if the average person who invests in a company um especially when you lower the minimums right like to me a thousand dollars is is a lot of money whereas you know twenty five thousand dollars to one of the investors in my previous company would have been their 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 uh same threshold right so you can't discount people by going, oh, well, they only put in a hundred bucks because a hundred dollars to them is very meaningful. And they want to ask you a question. You're the CEO of the company, answer the freaking question. So all of a sudden, like you, you have this times, times a thousand times 5,000, if you're lucky. Right. Um, so yeah. there needs, there, there almost, there, there are products being built actually for FAQ things and these private sort of investor relations products for, um, for the space. But you know, crowdfunding uh also we had to kind of deal with this stuff but but yeah it's 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 both a blessing and a curse that's right that's yeah. right well let's talk a little bit about the summit um because yeah. you've got another one coming up in april um so the security token summit so what happens there so security token summit is a very high-end more intimate event because we realized um so on april 8th is security token summit and april 9th and 10th is uh, cis and the reason why we separated these two things into two different events and two different companies was because um, they kind of have a totally different vibe and attitude. So CIS is great, 6,000 people at the Los Angeles Convention Center. It's craziness, there's a big expo floor, there's lots of people and it's like speed dating. Like you meet someone, you get their car, you, you, know, you, you say you're gonna follow up and you end up with a stack of cards at the end of the day. And, and you can turn that into a lot of value and it's really exciting and the quality is great. But um, what we wanted was to, especially in the security token space, because it's really where we're spending 90% of our time personally, we wanted to be able to sit down, like breathe, sit down, have a meal, sit next to someone and have these more intimate conversations. And people who might not want to go up on stage at, um, at CIS in front of thousands of people will be more willing to sit down and talk in front of the industry insiders, some of the top people in the space. And, and you know, we're capping the attendance at just 500 people there. Um, so uh, so we're, it, it, it's definitely um, in, in exciting, uh, an exciting few days. And, you know, at, at Security Token Summit, a good example of that is we always um, bug, you know, some of the biggest funds in the space to be up on stage at, at CIS. And sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. Sometimes there's information they can talk about publicly that they can't talk about or, or whatever. And they also all want to be on their own on stage and definitely don't like sitting next to the other funds. You know, like some of the big shots want to be alone. Right. Um, so, you know, um, which is totally understandable. They don't want to be compared to each other for different reasons and stuff like that. And so what we did at Security Token Summit is said, you know, this is going to be this high end, intimate, whatever thing. They all sign on board. And, but we said, but we're, 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 uh, we're going to force you to be up on stage together. Um, <laughs> so for, for example, we have the four, first four tokenized venture funds. So these are, you know, some of the biggest investors in the space all on one panel together on stage at Security Token Summit. Um, if they're on stage at CIS, they'll probably do their own private sort of fireside chats or something like that. Um, but some, we, we can get 
because of the different nature of the event, we get different type of talks. You know, we have the former vice chairman of NASDAQ speaking at the event. Um, we have uh, Ami Ben David, who, who people call the godfather of security tokens. Um, he's going to be uh, up on stage presenting Onera and stuff like that. So it's, it's going to be really exciting. And then, of course, CIS is going to be huge. We have thousands of people coming from all over the world, great companies. Um, and, and it's going to be uh, incredible. So, so tell me a little bit. So what would be the goal of it? There's education components. So, on, mm -hmm. you know, education, there's information from the industry and what's going on. But, you know, what's in it for the, the person attending to well, each, each of those two things? Um, each of two events. So uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted by a thing. It was, um, so, so what's in it for me to attend? Sure. Let's say the so security. For, for the, security the average. Limit and then. So for the average person, I would say if you're not in the space already, you're just looking to get educated and learn, CIS is a really good place to, um, to go. So we have, you know, from basics to super advanced, we purposely make it very mainstream. A lot of the panels will dive into the weeds, but they'll also start from the building blocks of the whole thing. And when you leave, you should be energized and excited about this incredible new opportunity and in industry. Um, with Security Token Summit, it is a bit more uh, inside baseball, right? Like you will, you will sit there and people are gonna start talking about two token waterfalls and splitting them up and doing all these, you know, uh, different things and diving into uh, diving you're, into the weeds. You're really in the weeds of the yeah, investment. Yeah, you're gonna get into the weeds, but if you, um, but on the, you know, but if you're maybe an institutional type of person, like you work at a bank or you work at uh, an investment bank or, or you, um, are an accountant or a lawyer, you might want to be there because you might want to get into, dive into some of those intricacies. So Obviously, You've got a good basis on the rest of the investment model. You're now going to understand how tokenization is shifting that or how it's, or how exactly. security tokens are sh shifting. Yeah, exactly. So, because we do have some of the top compliance people in the world there. So if you're a lawyer, you might want to learn and understand how, um, how the compliance products and pieces might work from, international jurisdictions or something, right? Because you might have a client that wants to invest in this space, or you might have a, a startup that wants to tokenize um, as a client. So you definitely want to know what's going on. Interesting. So, so now tell me a little bit before we go about your business. And, and so, I mean, you're running these events, but what, what is it that you guys are building underneath? So, yeah, these, these events took on a life of their own and, uh, and we sort of, you know, uh, in a way punished ourselves by adding a second event. Um, but what we do personally is we invest and advise in the space. And every year we take one or two companies that we really, really love that we meet at the conferences and we sort of double down on them and, and do as much as we can to help them. We've created this platform with the summit that gives us access to the whole industry. And so we, uh, we use that platform to help those companies. Ah, and you can be choosy then. So yes. you've got a nice, large environment to choose from. I you love it. You get to meet everybody from the startup side, but we also get to meet everybody from the investment side as well. And they're all, be, have become our friends over the years. And, and so it, it makes, um, it makes, you know, what, what we hate, and there's some people that do it well, we're not those people, or at least I'm not that person. Uh, you know, and, and generally most people don't do it well. You see these guys and, and, and girls, these women um, that have 15, 20 companies that they advise, 30 companies that they advise, all in the same space, all raising money at the same time. And you look at that and you're like, there's no possible way they can add any value to those people. Because if, if I'm an investor and I get 20 introductions from the same person, um, I can't believe that that person has vetted those deals very well, has really put thought and effort into it, and has any skin in the game themselves. It's just, it's, it's practically impossible. Um, there's very few, there's a few investment funds that make 30, 40 investments a year. And those people are beasts, and some of them do it really well, and some of them just spray and pray. And they have, some have a better track record than others. But with these individual advisors, they just don't look good. And we don't, we are very cognizant of not becoming them. <laughs> um, so which is why we, we only do sort of one or two companies at a time that we feel we can add value for. And um, there's a little bit of sort of CMO style um, consulting we do uh, that's, that's tied to that world. But 
But that's, you know, I'm really glad that you said that because that's where I see a lot of it falling apart. Because I, I, you know, I cover all kinds of emerging tech at all different stages, and what I see a lot of is that that it is truly actually the marketing side of things that actually fall apart for most companies. It's um, they don't have what I call market proof. So they aren't working to get marketing proof for the concept that they have. And so when you miss those, those two things linked together, you run into great trouble. And, um, and so I think that that's really interesting that you offer that in exchange. And because I think that that's, that's uh, in my numbers, it's about 56% of failures occur because of product market fit. And so it has nothing to do with investment yeah. and team. It's product yeah. market fit. So if you're providing that little bit, you have a higher likelihood for creating success for your, for your uh, investment community and success for those startups. So good for you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, you're, you're abs- you know, the people, people go all in on companies that they didn't really quite test. Uh, right. Um, they like one thing sounded good, but they didn't get how it was going to go to market or how, what was going to happen there. <laughs> yeah, or, or even in the tech startup world, there's these incredible products over and over and over again that get built, but the whole, you know, every ounce of, you know, resources they had went into building it. And then they go, oh yeah, we have to you know, promote this. And oh, we see that, that on the product side all the time. Like, <laughs> I know I, I'm very used to that model of, I yeah. just ran out of all my money and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. You won't make it then. Yeah. <laughs> That's such yeah. a sad, sad state to be in. Well, I am so excited that we met and I hope to continue this. And what I would really love Alon, is for you to send us some people that you think from your, whether it's post-conference or pre-conference, let us interview them. Let us add some value Absolutely. because and let them expose them to our community here because I think that, you know, our goal here at the New Trust Economy between Monica Profit and I is are to create a um, businesses and startups having success stories, having use cases, having uh, opportunity understanding of should I be doing this? And when you point out things like you just did, where maybe it's not the right thing, maybe you should have just the like disclaimer paragraph that we might tokenize when we reach yeah. the stage, but do it in a, in a standard way, you have a higher likelihood for a faster success today. I, that is yeah. great advice. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing that with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'll absolutely send more people your way and uh, follow Follow Tracy because I will send her uh, some promo codes for uh, closer to the event, maybe some giveaways of free tickets, but for sure some discounted tickets for, for your listeners. So Absolutely. So yeah, so that, as always, that will be in the blog post at newtrusteconomy.com and you can find us on Twitter and social media at New Trust Economy. So Alan, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. This has been Tracy Hazard on the New Trust Economy.